This is Cedric, and this is Cedric's Roadmap to Success. This can be a little bit different than I normally do. Um, I'm gonna get up and walk around, but we're gonna start out by talking about some of the basics. Um, one of the things, I, first thing I talk to the guardians about is exercise. Um, he, right now he gets walked uh, most days, um, but one form of exercise once a day is really not sufficient for a dog. So I talked about using this doggy Stairmaster. So we take a treat, we toss it down the steps, we runs down there, we say Cabo, or whatever the word is, and then we call him back up the top of the stairs and give him another treat and say Aspen. And so we create a command word, one to go up, one to go down. And I would keep on doing this with an empty stomach the first time until he looks at you like you're crazy. I'm not, I've gone down there 48 times in a row, I'm not going down anymore. Now we know what his maximum number is. He also likes to fetch and he also likes to chase this thing a little bit. It, it works better if you actually chase it for the video. There you go, go get it. So some dogs this is not healthy, but some dogs will chase this thing ad nauseum. And of course he's not doing it now that we're filming, but he was, there you go. And so this can be another nice way for him to, uh, way to exercise him. Some dogs this is not healthy, but it, for him he's okay. So the idea is start an exercise journal. Um, probably, uh, he probably needs to do the stairs like four or five times a day, probably play fetch once or twice a day. And a walk would be nice if we can do that as well, but the walk takes a lot more time. The stairs and the fetch and the laser are all quick. Something else you can do is scent games, uh, scent uh, meaning smell, and just you know, put him in another room and hide five treats and he's gotta find them. So just Google scent games, there's a lot of free uh, articles you can write, read and if he starts doing it, maybe get a DVD or a book. Uh, that's very mentally, uh, they use a brain so it's physically draining and stimulating for him. So um, he probably is under exercise. So if we can make sure we get him a big burst, of, uh, big uh, ex chunk of exercise in the morning and the evening, they have energy burst at the end of the, the beginning of the day. And then uh, again, keep that exercise journal, write down a uh, new page for every day, write down the time and how much exercise, how many up downs of the stairs, how long the walk was or so on. And then grade the end of the day, A through F. If you got anything other than a B or better, next day add a couple repetitions to each exercise or a whole extra repetition or a whole extra exercise. Instead of three fetches, we do four fetches um, throughout the day. Um, and eventually you get, come across with uh, the recipe for success for him. We can also set him up for success before we have guests come over, before he goes to the groomer, uh, before we go for a walk, we're gonna exercise him. Just make sure in those capacities, we give him about 10 minutes, 15 minutes to recover. He should no longer be going, that's called dry panting. We want him to stop doing that, and then we take him to the vet or the groomer. Um, now, for the groomer, I would suggest um, something we call a conditional motion response. Well, this is what part of what we'll be walking around. I'll just do it right here. Cedric, come. So he doesn't like the clippers or the trimmers. There's a lot of different things. So the vet can watch, or not the vet, but the groomer can watch this. A conditional emotional response is basically where we're going to introduce one version of the stimulus in a very easy capacity. So in this case, the scissors. You get, still see me okay? Mm -hmm. All right, so I have them both behind my back, and I've got treats in my left hand and the scissors in my right. So I hold it up, he looks at it, and I take it away, and I drop a treat on the ground. Sit. He doesn't have to sit, but I usually like to do it. Looks at it, and then it goes away, and a treat. So it's not the actual clipping of the clippers. It's not the sound of the clippers. It's just the sight of it. And eventually, at first, all he has to do is look at it, and I pull it away and drop a treat. Eventually, I want him to lean towards him a little bit. Eventually, he'll touch his nose to it. Now, the next thing you do is sit is you can do a little counter conditioning for this. So I'm gonna smash this treat so it's flat like a pancake. So I'm just getting used to the sound of the, of the scissors. You can also do the same thing with the trimmers, the electric trimmers, which a lot of uh, uh, groomers use. Now that's harder um, because that has a, uh, a vibration. Uh, shake, I usually don't recommend the shake, but for him also having all of us play with his digits without doing this at the vet. So, uh, or at the groomer, you wouldn't say vet. So what I would do is shake, shake, give him the treat, and then, and then hold one of his digits. Give him, and you can do this with kibble, and once we find a food that he likes, kibble, hold the treat, hold the digit. And at first you just wanna hold each digit out, and then let it go, grab the next digit, and the next digit, do that for all of his digits. Be a little bit weird for the back feet, but keep on doing that. And eventually, we're proceeding it with something good, and then we're just looking at his nails, and nothing bad is happening. Now, Dremels, um, and the trimmers, like I said, are a little bit harder. So for the tr uh, trimmers, what I would do is have go to your groomers and then have some, and maybe just do this with, there with the groomer. So you're giving the treat. So the groomer goes across the room and just notice that you just give the dog a treat. And as soon as the treat goes in the mouth, she turns the trimmers on and then uh, and he, she turns it off like a second later. So while he's chewing the treat, he hears the sound of the trimmers. And at first she's 25 feet away. 
and after a while 24, 23, 22, and it gets to 21 and he starts moving away, then we're reaching his breaking point. Then we stop and we come back the next time. We practice at 22 and then 21, 20. And so it'll, it'll go a little bit of ebb and flow back and forth, but eventually you get to the point where you're like right here, turn the trimmers on and off and he won't lean away from it or lurch. Now the trimmers on the Dremel, I do the same thing for a Dremel. Now, when we actually turn it on, it vibrates and that's hard for dogs. So what I would do for that is imagining this is the Dremel, come here, buddy. So I would, uh, now he's gotten used to the sound of it. What I would do is I would touch him with it with it off and just touching his back. So I give him the treat and eventually then I would turn it on so he'd feel the vibrations, but it's the back side of it. We're not messing with his paws. We're gonna help that vibration and he's having a positive association with that as well. And eventually at first you're gonna do it here, then you go up further and further and further and eventually you can get to under his chin and different parts of his body and he's comfortable with it. And this is a theme that I went through throughout the session is when he has problems, what we wanna do is we wanna recreate that situation. Sit, that's passive training, we'll talk about that in a sec. We wanna recreate the situation in the easiest version possible, breaking down into individual steps and then practice step one over and over and over again until he's comfortable with it, then we go to step two. And we're not doing the whole enchilada, and again, the easiest version possible, and again, we're exercising him ahead of time. So we take off that extra fight. Um, so uh, eventually you can get to the point where, uh, and then if you're using the Dremel, which is what I prefer instead of cutting the nails. So eventually then the dog's comfortable with us holding it and holding onto the nail, and then eventually uh, he's gotten used to the sound. Then what I do is I actually hold the nail up and I take the Dremel with it off, and I give him a treat first and I touch it with it off. Do the, the next one, next one, next one. So now he's just touching and keep doing that until he's not pulling away and he's pretty relaxed and you can pretty much give him Manny Petty and he'd be comfortable. Then the next time is you turn it on and this is when I would have a higher value treat like Chipotle chicken crash. Um, and then so you turn it on, give him the chicken and zip, but that's gonna probably make him spook. So you might only be able to do one paw and then no more chicken until he gets, uh, you know, until we do this again. And again, exercising first makes this easier. Um, I'm gonna move over a little bit closer, better camera angle. Um, and so eventually it gets to the point where you do a little bit more, a little bit more. Now when you do the Dremel, you should never do it more than like two or three seconds at a time. Uh, but eventually the Dremel is nice because you put that rounded corner on. And you do the same thing with the trimmers. So I have the trimmers backwards, so the cutting part is here and you're touching him while it's on, but first he's getting a treat. So he's feel comfortable about this. But again, the first stage is just showing him what that, it's called a CER or a conditioned emotional response. You can Google it and there'll be other videos of people who, who do that online. Um, okay, so um, we also talked about um, uh, rules. Um, some of the rules we went over for him is he shouldn't be allowed in the furniture at all. He supposedly only gets an invite, but during the session he jumped up a couple times. And also he is resource guarded on top of one of his guardians sitting on top. They, a kid comes over to pet him and he starts kind of growling. And probably, I don't think that's necessarily resource guarding. I'd have to see it, but it could also be like, I've got her now. You go find somebody else. It might be a jealousy sort of thing. So again, what we could do, the kids can come up and just hold a treat and let him have the treat and pet a little bit while he's on your lap. But if we take away the furniture, then that eliminates that. Now we can also be out on the floor and we want to cuddle with him. And if he does do that, again, we're going to do the same thing we did in the video above. We're just going to approach him in a high value treat. And then we turn and walk away from all sorts of different angles. Uh, but I, from what you, you were describing, I don't think that was research guiding. I think it was more of a jealousy. She's mine. So um, let me see. Uh, not only a lot of the furniture. Now, what you can do when you're in, because the family is thinking about transitioning right now. He lives kind of in the laundry room when they're not there instead of kenneling him. I, I would gradually transition him out of there. So again, do it at first. Let him be in your bedroom at night. And just close your door and make sure there's everything picked up so there's not a lot of temptation. And after a week, if he hasn't had any accidents, then open up the hallway, but make sure all the rest of the doors are closed. And then after a week he does there, we gradually give him a little bit more, more access week to week. Um, well, I like doing it when we're sleeping because that way we're home. A lot of times when we leave, they get stressed and they chew things to calm themselves down. So we do it when we're home and asleep, there's no reason to be stressed. Uh, now, for the, uh, if we do get to the point where he's out, then he might be getting up on the couch. Well, you can get something called X mats, the letter X M A T S, and you get them on Amazon. They're about 11 bucks a piece. You probably need one for each cushion of the couch. They're little white things. You open them up, there's little white plastic spikes on them. He will not want to sit on them and won't feel comfortable. Then when the people come, you just take it off, fold it, and put it under the chair, and then you sit down in your chair and you're comfortable. You get up to go to the bathroom, you pull it up, put it here, and it's kind of a placeholder. It takes about 30 days to form a new behavior pattern. After a month or two, he's just out of practice of trying to get up on the furniture. Now, he also likes to jump up on people. And when he does that, some of the family members pet him or we, they step back or they turn away. And so the new studies show that if, if you just become boring, that negates that. 
So when he jumps up on you, cross your arms, look up, and then just freeze and hold still. And when you get boring, he'll get down. When he does, you can pet him for getting down, or then you can continue doing what you think. But if you're, you know, every time we, you know, he jumps up on you, it causes you to become boring after enough repetition. Dogs learn through repetition, consistency, and good timing. You have three seconds to correct your ward. So if he jumps up on you, you're like, no, the dog guy said I gotta freeze. Now I'll call you back later. No, I'll totally do that later. All right, yeah, I'll talk to you then. And then we freeze, we miss that three second window. So just as soon as he does it, freeze. Um, and if, after enough repetition, he'll learn not to do that. Crash. Oh, I call that flop, actually. Um, all right, so um, let me see. Other rules, um, uh, not being allowed within the family, member, uh, within seven feet of anybody is eating. So when we're eating, we can pr uh, preface this by uh, practicing. Well, let's, let's walk and talk a little bit. Um, so basically, uh, this is kind of the, uh, the dining area is right over here. So I'd imagine there's a line that goes from the couch to here. He's not allowed to cross this line. So what we do is when we sit down here, instead of doing our actual meal, when we're doing our meal, we're distracted. We're thinking about eating. So instead what we do is microwave a piece of roast beef or bacon or something like that, and then set the table like we're sitting there. And we sit down, if I'm sitting here, and whoever's sitting there, and let's say the dog's over there, and they touch their nose, and that tells me, oh, he's, and I get up and I march towards him to make him leave the area. Let's see if, let's see if we simulate that. I'll do it with the treat first. So let's say he came over here. Whoops. I would now, I kind of screwed that up. I would have rather approached very suddenly, and that made him move backwards. And there we go. And then I take a step backwards, one step at a time. When I sit, I lose some perceived authority, so you expect the dog to try to come back again. And then I can go back to eating the pretend, pretend eating the bacon. So not really thinking about eating the bacon. So we can watch, and as soon as he crosses the threshold, we're, our timing is really good. We're correcting him. Um, now, uh, helping uh, when we're eating, it's just for him to be within seven feet of us is part of the reason. It's ironic because he's also a resource guarder, and that's kind of the same sort of thing. When you get too close to a dog that's resource guarding, they're like, hey, they disagree. That's the same sort of thing here. That's awesome. So if he sits or lies down, then we can put the bacon away and do our actual meal. So now he's showing us that he understands what we're doing. He's taking a less assertive position by sitting or laying down. Um, now we can also, um, I'll, I'll show you with the door. Let's go ahead and go this way. I'm gonna close the door so it's not backlit. But when people come to the door, there's a doorbell, um, he likes to run towards the door because that's where the excitement's coming. So what I was having the family do is, we'll see if I can simulate it with a knock here. Of course, now he's not doing it because we took our time to do it. The great thing about dogs is they let him in now. So this is a good example. Now he's warmed up, but if you practice what we're going to show you right now, it shouldn't take long. So what I was doing at first is I had uh, my puppy class instructor, Taylor, out there ringing the doorbell. So I would throw the treat here, and you have to film him, don't worry about it. And when he went over, and the second he looked it up, and she went, she rang the doorbell instead of a knock. I'm just knocking because that's what I have access to. And that caused him to bark and rush over here. And we kept on repeating this, and after a while, he didn't even look this direction. Doorbells ring like crazy. So this is the first stage, is we, ring, uh, we, we throw the treat to lure him away, and then we provide the stimulus the second it goes into his mouth. But after a while, what we want to do is we want the doorbell to ring, and then we want to throw the treat over there after the doorbell rings. So now the doorbell means I go there and I get a treat. So that will help him, and after a while, the doorbell rings and he runs away from the door as opposed to towards the door. Now we can do a couple other things for this as well. Um, then we have kind of an entry point A. There's three ways into this particular row four with the stairs. So I would say that when he's in here, he shouldn't be across this line. There's an opening here, there's an opening here, and then right back where the guard is. Uh, where the guardian is filming. So the first thing I want to do is I would like to teach him to move away from the door. Now this is different than the doorbell ringing that I was talking about. What I would do is if I wanted to go there, for example, I would, independent of at the door, I just throw the treat there. When he goes over there, I would call it, you know, Texas or whatever the word is that you mean to go to that specific place. I'd probably do it right where the guardian is standing right now, so it's a little bit outside the area. So the idea is without somebody at the door and no doorbell, no ringing, no knocking, I'm throwing the treat. He's going to that location and he's getting the reward and he's hearing the word Texas or whatever the word is. So now when somebody actually comes to the door, if he's up here in front of me and I try to answer the door with him in front of me, he thinks I'm assisting him. So now I can say Texas and he knows what I mean. Now if he doesn't do it, then I'm going to do the reverse hurting. I'm going to walk directly at him until he crosses the line and I stop at the entry point, which is right here. I take one step backwards and I pause. Don't take three steps, just two steps only and pause. 
When dogs communicate with each other through movement, they pause between the movements as a way of saying period, that was period. So it's the same sort of thing. So now take another step back, pause about this far. You don't have to pause very long, just a slow a little pause. Then I'm gonna keep my hips pointed towards him and I'm gonna recreate the sounds of opening the door. That's why you're really good at it. It's hard, make sure you go all the way, don't go. The guardian was just kind of going like this and she wasn't actually locking it, because it's harder, it's a good door. He actually just sat down or something like that. So normally this sound means the door's about to open. He rushes towards the door. Well, now he's staying there. Next step will be this. I want to make it as loud and as hard as possible when we're practicing. And I'm not doing this with a real guest. This would be a family member out there or one of the kids. Then when I actually open it, we have a security alarm. So that sound is also associated with it. Then I step on this side of the door and keep my hips pointed towards him. Then I step forward and open the door behind me. And if at any point during any of these things, he gets up and starts crossing or across the line, I stop and I rush towards the door. And I stop as soon as he gets across the line, or if he didn't get across the line, I march in and I'll bump into him if I have to until he gets across the line. But the suddenness of your moving towards him is what will move him away. I know I'm probably backlit right now. That's all right. I'll close in a sec. So then I would go in here. Hey, man, come on in. So that's the movement that I want to do. A little bit faster when I was doing that. I was trying to trigger the doorbell. I think we might have broken it. Did it ring? No, I pressed it. We might have broken it. So again, I'm stopping step by step. So when you, when you have friends and neighbors that can come by and help you practice this, then what it is, the UPS guy, you come over here and he just stops right there. Because we've conditioned and, we sh and this is great for him because it shows him the humans are in charge of taking care of this. Security of the pack is one of the higher... Uh, a dog a job that the higher dog would do. And so by showing him that we've got this under control, we're also helping him practice with more space in between the door and uh, where he's at. So if somebody tries to come in, be, he's not, I don't know if he's a door dasher, but a lot of dogs that are door dashers will try to rush out. Well, if we keep him 10 feet away, 15 feet away, it's not as quite as intense for him. Uh, so I practice this until you get to the point where you can say Texas or whatever the word is and he goes over there, or you move towards him, or he just stays behind the line on his own. And again, he can go around there and come here, he just can't cross that line, same thing over there. Um, all right, so um, let me see, what else? Uh, other rules that we talked about, um, you have to sit before you go to the door. Cedric, come. Come. Sit. Then I open the door. So if he doesn't sit, I say it one time, if he doesn't sit, I should reward you, shouldn't I? If he doesn't sit within three seconds, then I walk away and sit down somewhere. If you stand, you're temporary, you're transitory, you're waiting for him. So go sit down somewhere, wait one minute, ask Siri for a 60 second timer. After one minute, go back to the door, sit. Of course, he's going right away. And say it like that, like you're assertive, like you mean it. A lot of people are like, can you sit? And I was like, no, I cannot. So don't ask, tell him. And then if he, as soon as he sits, then we open that door immediately. So he's like, oh, sitting at the door is the way to get the door to open. Now, being a smarty pants that he is, he already kind of does that. But I would do it with both directions. If he's in the backyard or what's coming inside, also same thing. We want to open the door to the basement, make him sit. Also, don't let him run down the stairs. If we open the basement door and he rushes down the stairs ahead of us, then he's trying to take that leadership role. So as we're, uh, it's easier if you're going up the stairs. Can you come up and stand right over here? So if normally, I'm guessing he races up the stairs if you're going up there. So you come over here, Cedric, come on, buddy. So as soon as he passes me, I stop and I come back down. And I wait for him, I'm not telling him, I'm just waiting for him to come down, or I don't do some other things. So let's say you're just coming in here to grab a candle or something. Well, just go so go up the steps, because you're not even planning going up there. So if you're planning to go up there and you have to stop and turn and come back down, you get frustrated. So if you just take a step or two and you're not planning on going up there, and he runs up there and you, then you continue doing your thing, he's like, oh man, I messed it up. So what I want to understand is as soon as I take the leadership role, the humans stop following me. And as soon as I stay behind them, then they'll continue doing whatever the thing is. So I create situations like this where I don't want to go upstairs anyway, so I'm just going to use this as a quick practice opportunity. I have a dog named Max that's so excited uh, for the leash, he gets freaks out. So when I wake up in the morning, I, after I go to the bathroom, I'm going to the kitchen to make breakfast. I just touch the, the handles of the door where the leash is, and he starts freaking out. And when I go, I'm not even planning on taking it for an hour and a half. I'm setting him up for this. So by the time I actually go and open the closet door, I've done it on the way to make eggs, on the way away from making eggs, on the way to you know put laundry back and forth. After a while, he's like, oh, another drill. Same sort of thing for him. He is excited for the walk. So um, sit. 
So for the walk, um, if you're walking towards where the leash is, as soon as he walks in front of you, just like the stairs, as soon as he walks in front of you, turn around and walk away and sit down somewhere. We, uh, I thought we were going to the stairs What's, what's what it, for walk, whatever. He comes back and then we start walking again. And eventually you get all the way, and he actually did a really good job. We've already made it all the way to where the leash was, and he stayed behind her. Then you tell him to sit one time. If he doesn't sit within three seconds, then I stop and I got other things going on. And if he sits, then I start reaching for the handle, but you probably won't even be able to reach all the way and he'll get up. And also the guardian picked up the leash and she went to him. I want the guardians to get in the habit of having him come to them. So uh, and if he gets up at any point, we stop, sit. If he sits within a second or two, then I continue. If he doesn't sit, I put the whole thing back and practice and then uh, move away and practice again. And this is helpful to practice at times when you're not planning on taking for a walk. One of the guardians kind of made a oh sound, but it's not being mean, it's desensitizing. So the dog doesn't understand every time they pick up a leash, we're going for a walk. Um, just like humans, when a dog's overstimulated, that's when they're gonna be more likely to make a mistake. So if we help him be calm for the walk or for leashing or when guests come over, or whatever it is, he's gonna be better able and equipped to control himself. Um, eating is another big one uh, for rules. And for dogs in the wild, they spend 90% of their time looking for food. It is the most important activity when they do eat killer capture or find some food they eat in the order of their rank. So right now the guardians are not eating in front of him and he's kind of a picky eater. He's not on the best food, so well, uh, not a bad food, but it just he had some digestive issues. Go to the green spot, talk to them, find some good food that he likes, but make sure that when you feed him, you put the food in the bowl, he's not allowed to eat it. Then you eat something in five more bites, then you give him permission to eat. And when he takes his first bite of food, use that passive train, come up with, call it taco or empanada or whatever the word is that you want to eat. So every time he hears the word taco, there's food in his mouth. So taco means I eat food. Um, so, and then after, uh, if he goes over and sniffs the bowl and walks away, as soon as he walks away, pick up the bowl, dump it empty, put the empty bowl back down. He doesn't eat again until the next meal. Now he likes a greenie and that's like one of his favorite things in life. You want the greenie, you better eat your breakfast. You don't eat your breakfast, you don't get a greenie. Now we create a motivation, just like kids, if they just want the dessert, well, we don't let them eat their regular meal. You have to eat your regular meal to get the dessert. And so uh, don't over encourage. So Cedric, come, ask him once or twice. If he leaves the area, pick it up without any, and dump it and put it back down. If he goes longer than three days, text me, but usually by the second day, the dog, hunger kicks in and hunger becomes your ally. The only dogs that goes past three days when somebody in the house is cheating and giving them extra food, do not cheat because you're only cheating against yourself. Hunger becomes your ally. Uh, let me see. So those are other, uh, also look for opportunities to delay gratification. If he, he likes to play fetch, make him drop the ball and sit before you pick it up and throw it. At first, maybe you just make him uh, drop the ball. Um, and I, did I talk about at the beginning of this, how to drop at the beginning of the video? Well, just basically when he has a low value item, pull that tree, just hold it from his mouth. And we want him to practice dropping things that he's happy to drop, low value items. That will make it easier later on with the resource guarding for him to drop higher value items because they just tell me to drop, they give me something better, and then, uh, yeah, sorry, I've talked for a long time. Um, all right, um, also use passive training for like he takes a drink of water, call it cocktail or drink or agua. Every time his food, come up with a word for that. Um, when he's uh, moving forward, I say charge, my dog backs up, I say retreat, and now I have a command word. If my dog is in my way, I say retreat, my dog backs up four paces without knocking into something. Um, that's a really helpful command. Every time he brings you a toy, name all your individual toys. So he brings you a toy that's a little elephant, call it Trump. He names you, you know, brings you something else, name it whatever it is. So the idea is now you can say, go get me the taco or whatever, you know, apple or whatever the toy is. The dog goes and gets that particular item. Um, so passive training is waiting for the dog to voluntarily offer a behavior. Every time the dog comes to you on its own, pet him and say, come. Every time he sits down, pet him and say, sit down, so on and so forth. But for him, if, he, if you're petting him and he just like flips back on his belly, or on his back, stop petting him. If you're petting him and he's very gradually moves and rolls onto his back, that's okay. But if he flops back, that's, too, that's submission. We don't want to reward submission. And remember, anything your dog is doing when you pet him is what you're rewarding. The guardian inadvertently, I think, has been rewarding uh, and enhancing fearful behavior. And that's what a lot of moms do, a lot of humans do in general, because the dog's fearful, we pet the dog. Well, if the dog, I've had a fearful dog, I'll make him more fearful, excited, more excited, aggressive, so on. So you can lay your hand on the, on the dog, excuse me, without uh, ampl amplifying it. But if he is nervous about something, move him away from it. I like the guardian because he is nervous around stuff. We talked about counter conditioning. So I'd like the guardian to make a list of all the things, like a piece of paper. 
I mean, the piece of paper blowing around, she said it would normally freak him out. She actually did it a couple times and the piece of paper actually hit him in the head and he still kept on chewing the treat. So make a list of the, the, the hair dryer, the, you know, the washing machine. Uh, there's a whole bunch of different things. What we wanna do is we wanna get him far enough away where he'll sit and take a treat. That's what, and get him as close as we can, I guess, where we, he can sit and take a treat. And then eventually we get him one step closer, make him sit and give him another treat. When he gets to the point where he won't sit or won't take the treat, you're close to his breaking point. So back up one step and we'll practice a good one and then go away and come back again and take note of how many feet away that you were. Eventually you get closer and closer and closer. Eventually you'll be right next to it and the he can be next to the washing machine it's going and it's slurking around or slushing around and he doesn't care at all. Um, so make a list of all the things that he's scared of so we can systematically deprogram him. And again, if he resource guards or if he's scared of something, awesome. Cedric's Just a Game is another opportunity to help him get better at whatever this particular thing is. Now, last little one is uh, what I call petting with a purpose. Senator, come. So if he comes over and he nudges me with his nose for attention or jumps up or paws at me and I pet him, he's telling me what to do and I'm doing it. That validates, uh, tells him that he thinks he's in charge. But then later on when he tells me not to do something, I do it anyways, that confuses and probably frustrates him and causes some stress and anxiety. And stress, and stress is where all aggression comes from. So, Senator, come. Come. Yeah, you know what the tree pouch look is though, don't you? Yeah. Yes, he does. So when he comes to me, let's say he was nudging me for attention like that. If I pet him, then I'm telling him, he, 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 yeah, when you tell me what to do, I do it. So instead I say, sit, sit. Now I had a treat here for demonstration purposes. Normally we'd be watching TV and he should come up and nudge us because I want your attention. Or he'll grab a towel, which he tried to do to get attention. Remember, a lot of us train our dogs to do the wrong things. I grab a dish towel and I bring it to you and you try to take it from me and become the game. So we brought that over, I just pulled out a treat, held it like this, he wouldn't take it, so I dropped it on the floor, he dropped it, then he came a couple feet over, got it, and then we took the towel away when he wasn't paying attention to it. So for petting with a purpose, if he nudges me or pauses me for attention, he's telling me what to do, that's a leadership mindset. Instead, if he tells me what to do, instead of doing what he wants, I'm gonna give him a counter order, tell him to sit. When he sits, I'm gonna pet under the chin, and say the word sit and only the word sit, not good sit or good boy, just sit. So right there, crash is the word I use. That's passive training. So what will happen with petting with a purpose is after you start telling him, hey, when you tell me what to do, nothing happens. But if I tell you what to do and you do it, you get paid. After a while, he's gonna start sitting in front of you to prepay for the attention or laying down. So, uh, and when he does that, make sure we do recognize it. Now, if he comes up and nudging for attention and he's already sitting, tell him to lay down or tell him to come and sit over here. He just has to do something, something to change his state or prepay for that attention. Now, uh, and use a watchword, uh, I use paycheck means I think you might have petted without a purpose and I use testify or recognize your reward. So if I'm sitting here and he came up to me and I didn't see it, somebody says recognize, I just look at him and, and oh, he, he's laying down, I pet him and say crash. Or if he's standing, I pet him and say come. So now we're going to pay and reward him for the desirable things that he does, either organically or we're going to direct him to doing those things. If we get in a habit of petting with the purpose of passive training, every time we pet our dog, it becomes a micro training session that builds up the dog's respect for us as authority figures because it's listening to our command. It helps the dog boost its self-esteem because it's earning that affection and it's helping practice going to a sit or a lay down, which are more subordinate postures. So it really becomes a trifecta every time you pet your dog. Now, I also talk to the guardians because they have two kids in the house about how you can motivate your children to uh, want to work with the dog. So I always tell kids, hey, uh, when we pet our dogs, that's how we say thank you. So if you say please or thank, if you tell it, when I pet the dog, tell the dog to sit or do something first and then pet it to say thank you for sitting. And every time you do that and go tell mom and dad, they're gonna take an M&M &M and they're gonna put it in your jar. At the end of the day, you gotta grab your jar and put it on your dinner table and you can compare with your sister and say, I got more treats, more, uh, not treats, uh, M&Ms than you did. And you can give it to them as a snack or, or de dessert the next day or whatever. But that really, if you keep that in, in place for a couple of weeks, you'll be amazed at how much the dog starts following the kids around and following the kids' directions because the kids are giving a lot of affection, a lot of treats, and the kids are doing it because they're getting a lot of treats as well. So we're just using positive reinforcement all the way around. Um, let me see. Uh, is there anything else that we didn't cover that you want me to go over? Cedric, you get that up there. Well, Cedric, come here, buddy. You're gonna look like a parrot. This is, this is my parrot, Cedric, and this is his roadmap to success. Remember, everything you do trains your dog, only sometimes you mean it. Right, buddy? Thank you.